Today is June 19, a day proclaimed as a new Labor Day in Trinidad and Tobago. Since 1889, May 1st has been recognized as an international day of solidarity for all workers of the world. But it seems fitting that in this day of independence, we in Trinidad and Tobago choose a day that has deep significance for the nation, workers and managers alike. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has therefore proclaimed today, June 19th, as Labor Day. On the recommendation of the Public Holidays Committee, and in accordance with the resolution of the Trinidad and Tobago Labor Congress, at its second biennial conference in July 1970, that May Day, May 1, should be replaced by Labor Day, June 19th. Why June 19? Here's W. Richard Jacobs to provide some answers. The answers lie in the momentous events that took place on that date in 1937, 35 years ago today. These riotous events rocked the roots of the colonial society of Trinidad and Tobago. They precipitated West Indian wide riots that moved to Barbados, St. Kitts and Jamaica and together with similar riots throughout what was then the British Empire, they served as the basis for the reorientation of British colonial policy. The riots were local in focus, but international in scope. They were the subject of two major reports. The 1937 Foster Report looked specifically into the causes of the riots in Trinidad in that year. And the 1938 West Indies Royal Commission, more commonly known as the Moyne Commission, looked into the general state of affairs in the West Indies. The riots began on June 19th, but their roots were buried deep in the colonial history of the West Indian people, who had been set upon by the world capitalist system from the very landing of Columbus up through the introduction of slavery and indentureship. The threatened collapse of that world capitalist system in the great worldwide depression of the 1930s affected the West Indian agricultural economy most of all. And this had far-reaching effects on the whole West Indies, since a large proportion of the working force was employed in sugar and cocoa. The Moyne Commission commented in 1938, The trend of world conditions has become generally unfavorable to the development of territories like the West Indies who base their economic life in the export of agricultural commodities. As a result of these factors, money became scarce for the working class, and their foodstuff, the greater part of which was imported, became increasingly expensive. That was the economic situation in Trinidad in the 1930s. But it was a situation largely confined to the working class, for the big white capitalist planters and businessmen were still making enough money to be comfortable. The same was true in the case of housing, health and education, to name just a few. The working class lived in deplorable houses. Health facilities were inadequate and expensive. Education was available to the privileged few. In 1937, Foster described the village of John John, Port of Spain as an entangled conglomeration of unsightly, ruinous huts and privy cesspits placed helter-skelter on a sloping, steep and slippery hillside, a danger to health, life and limb for the local residents, and a menace to its surrounding city population. In the case of health, the Moyen Commission reported that laborers, peasant farmers, shop assistants, clerks, chauffeurs and domestic servants, among others of the working class, suffer hardship through having to pay the excessively high fees charged for medical treatment. Foster report 
presented an equally serious picture of the health situation. Hookworm was found in 79% of the people in Cunupia, and over 50% of all East Indian adult patients in Port of Spain had enormous numbers of hookworm. The collapse of the economy, the poor returns from agricultural and industrial employment, the disastrous health and housing conditions affected all members of the Trinidad working class, Negroes and Indians alike. Negro and Indian workers both also suffered from racialism at the hands of the white managers in oil and sugar, many of whom had, in the case of oil, come from South Africa, that bastion of white racialism. This racialism accounted in some measure for the hostility of the workers to the managerial class during the riots that were to come. In the judgment of the Moyne Commission, Perhaps unlike earlier disturbances, the discontent that underlines the 1937 and 1938 disturbances in the West Indies represents a positive demand for the creation of new conditions that will render possible a better and less restricted life. In Jamaica, Alexander Bustamante and Norman Manley arose to articulate the workers' grievances. In Barbados, Clement Payne paved the way for Grant Lee Adams. Marisho was the man in Grenada. A decade later, he was succeeded by Eric Gary, who spoke for the Grenadian working class. Ver Bird spoke for Antiguans. For the people of St. Kitts, Robert Bradshaw. Ebenezer Joshua spoke up for workers' rights in St. Vincent. In this field of giants, Tubal Uriah Buzz Butler held his own and superseded many of them. Butler was born in Grenada in 1891. During the First World War, he joined the West Indian Regiment and like many of the radicals of the 1920s, hero-worshipped Captain Cipriani who was in his heyday as president of the Trinidad Working Men's Association, the TWA. Butler came to Trinidad in 1921 at the age of 30 to work in the oil industry where pay was more rewarding than in the Grenada nutmeg fields. In 1929, he sustained an injury in the oil fields which left him with a permanent limp. Sometime between 1922 and 1930, Butler became deeply involved in the evangelizing Moravian Baptist Church and by 1930, he had established a reputation in the oil belt as a fiery preacher. Many of the members of his congregation worked with him, and he developed a personal relationship with them. Up to 1932, Butler was a strong member of Cipriani's TWA, and an equally strong supporter of Cipriani himself. The split be between the two men began in 1932. In that year, the trade union ordinance was passed. Cipriani took the radical position that the TWA should not register under what was essentially a reactionary piece of legislation, but should instead become a political party, the Trinidad Labour Party, the TLP. But this decision, though perhaps acceptable to both Butler and another leading light in the TWA, Adrian Kohler Rienzi, was reached by Cipriani after consultation with English trade union friends, and Butler and Rienzi had no part in the decision. Cipriani's dictatorial approach to decision-making alienated both Butler and Rienzi from him. Rienzi then set up his Citizens League in San Fernando in 1934. And in 1936, Butler finally left the TLP and formed his own British Empire Workers and Citizens Home Rule Party, more commonly known as the Butler Party. Butler's decision to form a political party was motivated by the events surrounding the 1935 Apex oilfield strike. On that occasion, the workers at Apex went on strike for better pay and working conditions. Cipriani and the TLP did not support the strike because they claimed that it was unauthorized. Authorized or not, Butler led the 120 workers who had been dismissed as a result of their strike action on a march to Port of Spain. By leading this march, Butler successfully demonstrated his commitment to action 
and charged Cipriani with backpedaling and somersaulting tactics. Butler later described Cipriani as a great leader on the war front, thousands of miles from Trinidad and Tobago. Perhaps this was a bit unfair, for Cipriani openly regarded himself as a reformer, while Butler thought of himself as a revolutionary. In that sense, they were incompatible, and the break was inevitable. Butler went his way, closely followed by Rienzi, and Cipriani went his. Faisabad was the base of Butler's party, a town described by the Foster Commission as an unkempt village on the edge of the oil fields. It is from here that Butler appealed to the work people from the standpoint of wages. His speeches and literature issued by his party became conspicuous for their violent character, and his following included, as subsequent events confirmed, many who were prepared to adopt violent methods. In his frequent letters to the governor, he mentioned about the rising cost of living, the poor housing conditions, the poor health facilities, etc. And as if by design, included in each letter was an item which highlighted the insults meted out to the black workers by the white managers. As if by design too, Butler's letters and utterances invariably made mention of the suffering of the Negro workers and the Indian toilers, as he called them. Oh, it's a sad thing to remember, you know. And it's sadder still for me to relate today, when things seem to have changed quite a lot. But, as I remember, the conditions of the poor Indians and Negroes in sugar and oil, respectively, was nothing short of subhuman. It was clearly a case for early rectification. But how to do it? Letter after letter was dispatched to the powers that be in the oil and sugar industry. No replies. We turned our attention to the government of the day. Every letter was attended to, acknowledged. But what about the alleviation of the condition of these poor workers? Well, nothing was attempted, nothing done. And so I thought that the time had come when we had to take positive action to achieve positive results in so far as betterment of the condition under which these people were forced to live and die and work are concerned. Different words describing the same system of exploitation made Butler's appeal a definite gesture Afro-Indian solidarity. This approach paid off, for when the workers went on strike on June 19th, it emerged as a strike of all workers, Indians and Negroes, directed against all employers. There are some necessary corrections which must be made in the Foster Report. The Commission suggests that the June 19th strikes were prearranged and that a signal to start the strike was given by Butler. But after painstaking research, I have been able to ascertain that the strikes actually started by accident. Though the Foster Report acknowledges that the strike started at Forest Reserve at 4 a.m. on the morning of June 19th, it goes on in apparent contradiction to say that the signal for the strike was given at 5.30 a.m., at least one and a half hours after the strike had actually started. All the information here is garbled and incorrect. During his treason trial, Butler himself refuted the suggestion that he authorized a June 19 strike, or that he had anything to do with any prearranged signal. For some time prior to June 19th, 
Butler had been addressing the workers in the south, telling them to be on the alert because he would call a sit-down strike at any time. At about 2 a.m. in the morning of June 19, 1937, an electrical failure at one of the oil wells close to the road of the Forest Reserve oil field forced the workers at that disabled well to sit down in the vicinity of the well. But the workers who passed on their way to the early morning shift, aware of Butler's impending strike, assumed that the workers at the disabled well had gone on strike. They circulated this rumor, and as a result, most of the workers at Forest Reserve proceeded to participate in a sit-down strike themselves. Apex workers took similar action soon after, and at 5.30 a.m., when the estate police proceeded to remove these strikers from the premises, the retreating Apex workers burnt two oil wells. There was nothing prearranged in this. By 7 a.m. on the 19th, most of the workers of the adjacent oil fields had gone on strike on the assumption that Butler had ordered the strike. In fact, Butler was in La Brea and knew nothing about the strike until about 10 a.m. on the 19th when a delegation of workers arrived at La Brea and informed him that the strike was spreading. Though he was at first apprehensive about sanctioning the strike, when Butler arrived in Faizabad at approximately 2 p.m. on the 19th of June, he was enthusiastically greeted by a large crowd and apparently decided at that time to support the strike. Later in the evening, around 7 p.m., the police attempted to arrest Butler for using violent langu language and counseling acts of violence while he was addressing a meeting. But the crowd prevented the police from arresting Butler and a plainclothes policeman, Corporal Charles King, who attempted to arrest the escaping Butler, was beaten by the crowd. Oil was later poured upon him and he was burned to death. These events have, over the last 35 years, been commemorated in Faisalabad. The following short excerpt shows how it was commemorated in 1965. Labor and workers meet again to mark the 20th anniversary of the 1937 riots at the famous Charlie King Corner in Faisalabad. After his jump attempting to escape incensed workers, King, a policeman, was burnt to death. To labor militant for its rights, attention was also given. This year, government moved swiftly in labor legislation and introduced the Industrial Stabilization Act, remembering a worker who fell. And Uriah Buzz Butler, 1937's dynamic labor leader. These were the workers who marched 50 miles into Port of Spain in 1937 to improve the lot of labor. Before the rising sun. Rising... like an ever rolling stream. And Butler the old fighter, now honored as a patriot and granted a pension by government. The men and women of Trinidad and Tobago who contributed to the vibrant development of the trade union movement. The spot where Le Bray Charles died. With the labor sector active and alert, the Industrial Stabilization Act with an industrial court provides the guidance and framework for the development of trade unionism.